You're listening to the Boston Audio Engineering Society Annual Banquet, recorded on April 12, 2019, with special guests Steve Albini and Kurt Ballou, moderated by John Snyder of Electronic Audio Experiments. We would like to thank our sponsors, Pro Audio Design, Augsburger Monitors, Parsons Audio, and Audio Builders Workshop. A very special thanks to Isotope for hosting this discussion. Uh, how's everybody doing? Yeah. Okay, my name is uh, John Snyder. Uh, I live here in Boston. I make pedals um, and I work on a PhD uh, tirelessly um, and miserably. And this is a great joy to be here tonight. And uh, you know, with two uh, pro producers, not producers, engineers and guitar players whose work I admire a great deal. Um, and hopefully we can facilitate some good discussion tonight, uh, not just about, oh, what compressor did you use on this record that was, you know, really cool to me, but, you know, more about the philosophy of making records in general, about crafting music in a controlled environment, um, you know, like things like how, you know, being a guitar player influenced uh, the process of making records and, you know, where you come from, where you're going in the future, that sort of thing. So I guess uh, to kick this off here, um, the question that I really wanted to ask was, how did uh, your instrument of choice sort of take you into being a recording engineer? Not just, oh, I'm the guy who, uh, you know, my band needed to make this record at this time. We needed to bang out a seven inch book real cheap. But like, how did you actually get there? What, what took you to the process of really wanting to dive into the nuts and bolts of making a record? Start with Kurt. Start, okay. Um, well, I think, like um, like a lot of people who made music that nobody else but themselves seemed to be interested in, um, we didn't have any budget to really to make records, and um, so the responsibility for um, making the records, or at least steering the ship and working with another studio, had to fall on somebody. And um, I'm, I guess I'm of my bandmates. I'm probably the the person with the uh, the, the maybe the best uh, or the most patience for technical stuff. So I think that responsibility just kind of fell on me. And I've, I've always been the one who took things apart and tinkered with it. And whether that be taking apart a guitar or taking apart a song, like I've, I've always been the tinkerer of the band. So I sort of just fell into that role. And I think a lot of, a lot of bands have a, a situation where a, a natural division of labor forms over time where, um, where you, you know, each band member has complementary skill sets and sort of takes the lead in one avenue of the band. And for, for me, it ended up being the, the technical production stuff. Cool. My, uh, I, I'm a, a smidge older than Kurt and my experiences in a band were much more um, sort of homemade in all aspects. Like uh, I had heard about having guitar effects and stuff like that never seen one but in guitar player magazine they published schematics of craig anderton projects Classic. and so i took it on myself to make one of those and it and to my amazement it worked and i was actually able to make my bass guitar a little bit louder um so that that was literally the first inkling that i had that there was anything beyond the physical playing of the instrument that was involved in in making music and then uh, my band, I was going to leave for college. My band wanted to make a recording of itself, and it fell on me to be the guy that went to the guitar shop and rented the four track to make the recording of our, our music, right? Then when I moved to Chicago, I got, fell in with the punk scene there, and uh, in, the, in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a, a paradigm that was pretty evident everywhere I, I looked, which was that people in the punk scene didn't just do one thing. Like if you were in a band, that also meant that, you know, you would be the guy that would host visiting bands at your house, or you would be the guy that would put up flyers for your friend's show, or you would act as a local promoter for a touring band that called from out of town and needed a gig, or you would write for a fanzine or take photos for bands or help run a record label. Like everybody was a multifaceted, part of a big big interconnected enterprise it, it wasn't a self-centered thing where i wanted to do things for my band and myself it was 
we are all in this together. How can I chip in to, so that I can be a part of this community with all these other people who are chipping in and doing stuff? And uh, everywhere at the time, everywhere you would go, you would find these, you know, jacks of all trades that would like, uh, you know, like, oh, I, I, I know this guy who has a van you can borrow that, you know, like, like everybody did everything for everybody. Mm -hmm. And um, I sort of became, I became a resource to that community as a guy that could do recordings of bands. And it, I, it never occurred to me that it would be a profession until one day it was. And then, uh, I, you know, and the, the, the arc of getting there from that first band that I was in that, where we did a recording and until I was able to quit my straight job and just be a recording engineer like that, that whole span was about eight or nine years during which time I could have gotten a law degree or an MD or something which could have generated actual money. But, um, <laughs> Uh, and I don't, I, I, I don't think I could have done it any, any quicker. So I feel like that apprenticeship, that informal apprenticeship that I served under no master, I guess, mm. was, uh, you know, it was time well spent just given that I, I'm still basically doing all of that shit that I was talking about with all of the same people that I was doing with, doing it with then, you know, I still regularly interact with and work for people that I first worked for 20 odd years ago, you know cool thing um so you you sort of refer to this like arc of uh you know from i guess like a diy roots to something perhaps a little more substantive uh did you realize the inflection point from let's say like intentionally uh you know diy sort of for lack of a better word lower quality uh work? Hey. <laughs> It's an, it's an ethos, right? It's an aesthetic. Um, you know, transitioning into something that would be more, um, you know, like your, your philosophy of like a very accurate representation of the source material. Was that like an active progression that you undertook? I or will was it? fight you. <laughs> I was always trying to make good records. They just came out bad, that's all. <laughs> that's no, important I, to you. I'm, I'm overselling it, but, that, but yeah, it was never my intention to... I mean, I always had to, in the punk scene, you always worked within your means. Like mm -hmm. if, you know, if you had a $40 guitar and you broke a string and you didn't have, an, uh, you know, if you didn't have a, a buck to buy a single, then you would play a five string guitar for a while. Like that's just the way, that's just the, the mentality uh, that I was steeped in. Sure. So I always worked with whatever I had at hand. But I was always trying to do a good job. Well, it's, it's I guess uh, the, the sort of point I come from here is, you know, in punk music, you're intentionally trying to capture a lot of very ugly sounds, something that I think we can all attest to. Yeah. And so that's sort of, the, it's always a unique push and pull to me in that regard. Um, but what about you? Do, would you care to comment on the sort of sure. progression? Um, I think the development of um, becoming a recording engineer is really similar to the development um, that most musicians go through where in their early, in their early life, they're aping things that they love. And then over time, you know, their style becomes an amalgamation of those things. And, and with any luck, they develop, um, a, a set of tools where they can be as malleable as they need to be. And, and, you know, and I know some people really try to develop a style of their own. I think that that's a natural progression that, that happens over time. So I think that's what happened to me, you know, like, Early on, you know, so I, I worship like Don Fury recordings and like, you know, objectively they're not very good, but like I love those, the, the records and eventually started to, to be able to separate my love of the energy of the music um, and my appreciation of certain sound qualities and, and saw those as two related yet potentially independent things. So would you say there was a, a record that represented an inflection point along that time or is it more in, of a... In my discography? Sure. Um, no, it's a very long, slow, you know, kind of, you know, two steps forward, one step back kind of thing where, you know, you go on tangents, you, you progress, but then you plateau and then maybe you progress again. You got to find some sort of trick in order to kick yourself into new learning, whether it's going to a new environment, new piece of gear, working with new people, talking with new people. A lot of times I've caught myself regressing in, in my talents. Like, um, I would say like 50% of the time that I hear a record that I had done in the past, you know, 50% I'm like, oh, wow, this record's terrible. What the work I'm doing now is so much better than the work I was doing back then. And the other 50%, 
I'm thinking like, wow, this is really good and I suck now. Um, and it's always like, it's always emotional for me to like listen to the back catalog because I'm feel like I'm just at, um, just like sort of looking, looking myself in the mirror and, and sort of face to face with my own lack of ability and, and, um, and the self-loathing that comes with that realization. <laughs> I, you touched on something that I think is kind of interesting. Like you mentioned, you know, that uh, there's a, a record that changed your life or whatever, you know, that, but where objectively it's not a very good record. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I feel like there, there has been a shift in the paradigm. It used to be that there were sort of objective standards as to what made for a good sounding record. Absolutely. And, uh, and, uh, but when I think about the records that have meant the most to me, some of them, are, from a technical standpoint, are fucking train wreck. Yeah. But I wouldn't change a hair on their heads, totally. you know. Like, I, and so I feel like the the notion that that uh, that um, records can or should be made to fit a, a uh, like a um, an archetype of what makes for a good record that's finally sort of dissolved. And and it, I think that the final nail in the coffin was the fact that now the, the a great majority of even very big records are made in a semi-professional environment or, you know, in somebody's apartment or on a laptop or on an iPhone or something mm -hmm. like just the number one country record, n number one hip hop record from the last couple of weeks was made on an iPhone, I think. Really? You know? Yeah. Pretty amazing. That's so, cool. uh, like I can't, I can't, you know, from my standpoint, I'm always, I'm always striving for as an as a starting point, I'm always striving for naturalism or accuracy sure. in, a, in a recording. But when I think of the records that have blown my mind over the years, like you know, the, some of those records, like I don't think anyone would have willfully made that record sound that way. It mm -hmm. just came out that way, and the greatness survived whatever you know, uh, whatever happened to it's it. It's either because of or in spite of. Yeah. Yeah. But as a finished thing as a as a you know as a total enterprise like i wouldn't change raw power sure i know a lot of people have tried over the years and all of those Iggy included right? yeah exactly <laughs> but um but that record is like somebody throwing a cup of coffee in your face you yeah. know it's not it, it's it's an amazing document of the mania that those people were in at the time and, and i feel like like it's one of the one of the few truly insane records that survived that whole yeah. process. I have a question for you. Hit me. Literally? Well, no. <laughs> um, it's getting violent you, in here. Do you remember the first time that you heard a recording? Like not, not the first time you record, re heard recorded music, but, but the first time you perceived that recorded music as a recording and not just a representation of a song? Like there was something like in when the was I aware of the record? Yeah, you're as like, a oh wait, this has a, from this has a sound that had to be created in some way. It's like and the first time you hear hard panned guitar. Like, yeah, something like that, or like phenomenon. yeah, I'm room mics I'm very whatever. old, so it will be yeah. uh, it will be a kind of slightly archaic and corny reference. Yeah, uh, but there there was this guy named Dickie Goodman who made records that were mm -hmm. snippets of other popular records okay. that were interwoven into a script from a fake news announcer. Interesting, okay. And uh, at, that was the moment when I realized that, you, that, um, that records were um, artifacts rather than an entity. Like, like when I'm listening to a record, I'm not listening to a, a complete experience what i'm listening to is the document of something else yeah and this guy was just like snipping little pieces of records out. does anybody remember dickie goodman does anybody he was a radio dj and he would like like a dr demento kind of very very his stuff was very popular on dr demento oh yeah. okay yeah you remember dickie goodman yeah. yeah so that was when i was a kid i was probably six or seven years old uh, when i first heard a dickie goodman thing and it must have been where he was like uh using the sort of guttural ejaculations that were popular in, in doo-wop music, like the <laughs> papa ooh mau mau, that kind yeah. of stuff. Mm -hmm. And he was using that as punctuation for this little script that he'd written, and, and it was apparently a routine that he did as a DJ, and he started hmm. making records of them, and then those records themselves became... Interesting. They were like the first meta objects of pop culture, I think, yeah. were records made out of records, you know, or a DJ making a record out of records to be played by a DJ. Right, you know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in terms of recording, like the, when I fir the first time I heard a recording and realized that there was something to the recording that made the music, it somehow like it amplified the music, um, was probably the Alice Cooper Love It to Death record. All right. Yeah.
It was just something about the way, like every scream seemed to extend beyond the human length of a scream, you know? Yeah. That's a deep cut, but I like it. So I, uh, I do want to make sure that we take some questions from everyone else, but uh, there was one final one that I want to <clears throat> dive into, um, more of like a, a meta perspective on gear, which is uh, at some point in playing guitar, was there a piece of equipment that you plugged into that just, just broke you? Like these, uh, at some point you find some weird thing you, you, you plug into and you turn some knob setting on, you have never heard that sound before in your life and it just totally uh, alters your perception of what the instrument can do and, and sort of, uh, you know, for a lot of people, it's the first time they plug into a reverb pedal and they're like, wow, this is crazy. This is unnatural. This is, you know, taking me to space and I'm never going to come back. Um, but did you have a moment like that? And uh, if so, what was it? I'll start with Kurt for this one. Hmm. I, I th well, actually, yeah, yeah I, I think I did. And it was, it was the... Um, it was, I didn't have a guitar amp to start with. Um, and so it was the uh, record pause on the cassette deck and plugging uh, into the, 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 TS, the TS mic. <laughs> the TX mm -hmm. fuzz. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, so, so my, um, my friend Rob and I wanted to start a band together, and neither of us knew how to play an instrument or own an, or own an instrument other than, like, you know, high school band stuff. And uh, we, we made a pact. Um, we both wanted to be the bass player, so we made a pact. Whoever could get money for a bass first got to be the bass player, and the other person had to play guitar. It's a rare conundrum. Um, so I ended up with, um, I ended up having to play guitar, because um, <laughs> his his family was a little well a little out. more well off than than I was. Actually, you'd really like you'd really like Rob. He's like a really super creative guy. Um, he. I'll tell you about him later. Can I um, ask your thinking? I, I started out playing bass guitar because I wasn't a musician. I didn't have any musical training, and I thought um, the bass guitar had fewer strings and would yeah, be easier yeah. to learn. Is that why so you chose I actually, it? That's why you yeah, yeah. I mean, that was that was my that was my plan. Yeah. I just got stuck with guitar, but I had previously. <laughs> I mean, clearly, bass is easier because there's fewer yeah. strings. Absolutely. Um, and I think that that's true of most bass players. Mm -hmm. um, but. Uh, I, I had previously like restrung my father's acoustic guitar that he never played with four strings on it. So it was like I populated like the E, D, and B locations with like a, a you know an E, D, and uh, or an E, A, and D, and then so I had these big string spacings for the first three strings, and then like the tight the last two. And I started trying to play bass lines, um, mostly just like um, things that I was trying to figure out stuff that I've been playing in marching band on guitar instead of on saxophone. Um, but yeah, it's good. I like it. So yeah, TAC fuzz. I think it was a Panasonic. I, but, um, I, I had exactly the same experience. Yeah. And I remembered, uh, I used to play my guitar in the pause on the cassette. Uh, and I remembered reading in Guitar Player Magazine, which I read religiously, despite not being particularly a guitar player, um, that Leslie West used to do guitar lessons for people. Really? And he would plug the two guitars into the two inputs on the TAC, and that way he would be in one ear and his student would be in the other ear, and they would start the C60, and he would, they would go through the lesson, and then he would give the kid the cassette of the lesson when it was over, so the kid would have the lesson with the exercises on it on, in one speaker so that he could play along at home. That's really cool. Yeah, I thought That's that was pretty nice. clever. I mean, I, a lot of split stereo is always great. I've always, like... I've done that, like rough mixes for bands a lot of times. Like if like uh, somebody had to learn, like a bass player had to like learn a song, you pan like everything from the song to the left and the bass part to the right so yeah. they can like follow along. My profound fondness for the Ramones comes from the ability of that first Ramones album to fucking crush a party if you pan it to the DD side. And, <laughs> and it's just butter, 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 Yeah, it's fantastic. I, that's, that's how I learned to play bass as well, by listening to the D.D. side of the first Ramones album. It's a good place to start. So it's like D.D. was your Leslie West. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to picture him giving bass lessons now. It's not. <laughs> Ooh. <laughs> well, I think, so at this point, uh, I figure we can take some questions from everybody else and just see where things go. So one of the things you were saying about sort of the, the lo-fi nature of early records uh, kind of strikes me, because a lot of people come in now and they're like, hey, we want this to sound like you didn't really try or it's unproduced and that whole thing um or you know they're trying to do like a 60s thing like wow let's distort the vocal and so this is sort of a two-part you know on on one hand i say well if that stuff was distorted back then it's not because they wanted to it just happened and then the other thing with making a record sound like you don't care i'm like well that takes just as much like effort and thought 
and careful work as making a record that sounds hi-fi. Uh, yeah, I try not to overthink it too much. Like if the if the if the band says we'd like to distort the vocals in this part, I just do it. Right. You know, and and I'm not. I don't. There's there's always an underpinning for every every there's always a rationale for every decision a band or engineer or producer makes, but I I don't I'm not I try not to be a psychologist about it I basically just I everybody likes what they like, I, personally I'm I'm sick to death of doubled vocals if I never heard it again in my life I'd be fine you know. Um, but there are some people whose aesthetic is just so rooted in that as a notion like every, all, vocals are supposed to be doubled because that's the way real record sound, you know, like so, and they right. just can't conceive of it in any other way. And I'm happy to indulge that. If somebody wants to do that, that's their business, you know. It's, I mean, I still think of it as a, like it's a service industry, what we do. And if somebody comes in and says, I want this, you should do your level best to give them that, you know. Yeah. I think one of the things that I was trying to get at though was, do you feel that like a lo-fi record still takes as much effort as a hi-fi record? Don't you put as much into you, it's just we're making different decisions and we're twisting yeah. different knobs and choosing different gear, but we're still, it still takes sort of thought and effort and trying. I mean, I would have to say, I mean, I'm, I'm assuming this is true for Kurt as well, but the, the, the great vast majority of bands that I work with are not looking for an external designation like this is a lo-fi record or this is a psychedelic record or this is a whatever kind of record. They just have a mental image of the record that they want to make and they, they whatever by whatever means we get yeah. there, they'll get, that, that's what they want the, to do. The, the marketing people classify it later. Yeah, I, I, I think those, those kinds of um, identifiers are, are, I mean, I suppose in, in, in like a very naive situation for people who are just getting started making music and they want to communicate their intent to somebody else, they'll use that kind of language. But I know nobody actually speaks that way. <laughs> you know, like nobody, like Lou Barlow doesn't say, I'd like to make a very lo-fi record. Like it's, you know, <laughs> it's just, they're, they have an aesthetic and that aesthetic can have elements of sloppiness or elements of mayhem to it and uh you know and so but yeah uh I, it's it's just as difficult to make a very specifically awful record as to make a record that's conventionally <laughs> classically great yeah just just a little aside on that question um i think it's it is interesting that you you um you mentioned that a lot of those like say 60s recordings with distortion on the vocals and whatnot um are not made intentionally that way i think a lot of those types of bands don't realize that that's why a lot of that stuff was cool is like the the just the production limitations of the time and which is why so many of those musicians later in their careers when they had access to higher fidelity technology make ended up making less compelling records right. you know, it sort of comes back to that classic brian eno quote you know the the flaws of a medium become its hallmark for the next generation of people uh, you know, consuming via that medium. I yeah. also, I think there is a degree of um, received wisdom that is just patently bullshit though. <laughs> like uh, um, the fact that there are plugins that emulate the noise of an analog system that people can use to superimpose on their digital recordings, their pristine recordings to mimic uh, what is an, in every respect a, a failure mode, mm -hmm. you know, or that there are, uh, tape saturation plugins, things like that, where essentially every competent engineer does his level best to avoid tape saturation. Mm -hmm. uh, like those things, uh, the, there's this bizarre kind of talisman quality to things like that where someone listens to a, a, an astounding record and they try to like reverse engineer what made it astounding. And the, the things that they can identify as externalities are things like, well, there's some distortion, there's some tape hiss. Oh, look, it, it's entirely mono until this moment when they're, you know, think that you can make a, 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 a you know, a, a grid of all the technical uh, reductive arguments that you could make about each moment in the song or, or whatever. Uh, but none of that, honestly, is why something is good or, or bad. I feel like this obsession with the artifacts and obsession with the the failure modes is is sort of like if you if you see a really fast car and that car has a dent in its fender right and then you go home and start denting your own fender mm -hmm. in the hope that your car will go faster mm -hmm. i mean it's, they're just unrelated like when i listen to um 
Patsy Cline's Crazy, for example. Mm. If you concentrate really hard, you can hear a little bit of tape hiss in there. That's not why it's good. Right. You know. But that journey to reverse engineer it may actually cause cause people to find something else cool that they wouldn't have found otherwise had they not put sure, the thought but, yeah, into. Sure, but also going to the grocery store could as well. Sure. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, honestly, I, I believe any anything that can jumpstart your creativity, anything that can cause you to, to, to look at things differently, to create things differently, that, that jumpstarts your creativity can be very valuable, yeah. even if it's not uh, a noble pursuit in the beginning. Yeah, well, and, and a lot of mistaken things end up creating their own distinctive moments. Like there are, yeah. you know, like there's a lot of apocryphal information about various different things that the Beatles did in the studio, sure. for example. And, you know, so eventually some band might do something that they think they're doing in homage to the Beatles singing into a toilet bowl or whatever. <laughs> yeah. Um, when th that's all apocryphal and nonsense, but when they actually sang into a toilet bowl, it sounded kind of good, you know? Don't you hate that? When, like, when a band comes into the studio and they, they're like, have been reading about Sylvia, Sylvia Massey, like recording guitar through a hot dog and like <laughs> somebody, you know, somebody doing that and then they want you to do all that stuff and it has absolutely no bearing yeah. on their music. Yeah. Um, I, I'm I'm still in the service industry mode. Like I'll still give it a whirl. Oh know? yeah, of course. Because it's, it's well, it's easier to try it. Well, most times, it's easier to try out a band's idea than it is yeah. to like talk them out of it. Yeah, the the a, a yeah, big not, right. a, a big inspiration in that I regard. I love when I get proven wrong. Know, like, a big inspiration in, in that regard to me was there was an engineer in Chicago named Ian Burgess who was kind of like the friend of all bands in Chicago. He was the sort of go-to punk rock engineer in in the day and. Um, his attitude was, as soon as somebody voices a crazy idea, he jumps up out of the chair and starts doing it. And then if the other band members eventually say, no, 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 let's not do that, then they'll stop. But, you know, and my friend Jeff Pizzotti from Naked Reagan used to occasionally test him, like, all right, I want to put the guitar amp in an aquarium and fill the aquarium with marbles and then pour salad oil in the, on the marbles. And, and he was like, I think there's an aquarium in the closet. And he'd get up and start looking for the aquarium, you know. Like, uh, and I really admired that attitude, that, that attitude of like, you know, if you have a goofy idea, let's at least give it an airing, do it. you know, yeah. it, because uh, like you said, it's easier to just do it and see than it is to try to mentally form a, you know, a, a, a logical a, uh, avoidance of that idea, you know. I just wanted to ask, because this record in particular, uh, Crawl Self-Titled, Cleveland, Ohio Band, is one of my favorite records that you have documented. I just wanted to know the kind of background on what was it like recording this band. Crawl were a really unusual, they were a hard rock Wait, Did you do this band. at Mars? I, I worked on, I don't remember which, so I did three records with them, and I don't remember which okay. studio this was. Uh, is Mars the place that was I, off I the heard, highway with a wood panel? It's, it's Bill Karecki. I heard a story yeah, 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 yeah. about you at Mars yesterday. Oh. Okay. Anyway, go on. <laughs> Sorry. I'm sure it's true. Um, but uh, the interesting thing about Craw, the thing that distinguished Craw from all the other, there were a lot of noisy, uh, gnarly, like sort of prog, proggy, abstract metal punk bands at the time. Like there were a lot of bands that were mining similar territory. The thing that distinguished them was there were there was a really specific and distinct division of responsibility in the band. They had two guitar players, Rocky and Dave, I think is the other guy. And uh, Rocky always played the song. Like no matter what was going on around him, he was playing the song. He played the form of the song, no ups, no extras, no ifs, no ands, no buts, he just played the song. Dave, the other guitar player, played anything but the song. He was always running interference. Like, like whatever else was going on in the song, his thing was always an abstraction of it or at cross purposes to it. And then their vocalist was a uniquely, singularly tuneless vocalist. And um, there's a, if you, if you can imagine the constituent parts of an amazing uh, evocative vocal performance, there's, you know, the, the text, the emotional clarity or intensity or the, the conveyance of a genuine emotional state, uh, and then the, the sort of gripping performance, the, the gripping aspect of the, of the delivery, and then you know, the, the tuneful aspect of it, that is the following the song, paying attention to the song. And I would include things like the rhyme scheme and stuff like that as the, in, the, in the musical part of it. So he, their vocalist was 
utterly unique in that he was absolutely top of the scale at all of these categories except anything to do with music. <laughs> so the text was always interesting. It was generally political and it was always, you know, reasonably well articulated and all, you know, the choice of words was always great. His commitment and delivery was absolutely like first rate in the studio. A lot of a lot of people kind of adopt a singing persona when they get into the studio where they're not singing as themselves, they're singing as a kind of a showbiz entity that they wished they inhabited, right? Uh, his was just exactly the same as if he cornered you in a bar and was shouting at you, right? <laughs> so those, those things, plus they were all great musicians. So you have great musicians playing in this format of a band that was simultaneously rigidly, fastidiously musical, and also completely abstract and errant. So um, that's what I think what distinguished them as a band, and that they were consistent through like the three, they, they did a reunion spin yeah, not that long ago. Commemorating like the re-release of those like three records you worked with. Them. Yeah. And that's sort of kind of how I discovered those other two records. That CD was a gift from my sister along with like two unwound albums. Like that was a good year for you, honey. From you know. <laughs> yeah. it's like just kind of like learning about like your kind of past discography with like Black, Shellac, and all the other bands you've recorded, Jesus Lizard, Slim. List goes on. It just sort of kind of like really kind of inspired me. It's like wow, abrasive textures are just equally as important as like the songwriting, but like in the right context. Yeah, I'm, I, I, one of the things that punk, punk rock broke was it broke the list of things that you were supposed to take seriously and made it so that basically anything anybody proposed you had to take seriously because all of, some of the most absurd things become life-changing elements. So whereas previously, you know, if somebody was an, an inept musician, um, they wouldn't necessarily have the opportunity to make a record. Punk rock broke that, and it made the ideas more important than the execution, and the execution actually becomes kind of part and parcel of the aesthetic of the whole enterprise. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of those records myself. Yeah. I'm going to use uh, High on Fire as an example because you guys are both recording them. Uh, I'm interested not in like the nuts and bolts of setting things up in the beginning, but just like what kind of a headspace you guys are both in. I know, you, Steve, you say you're very transparent and you just try to replicate what they bring in, but like, once you figure out, like, okay, I am recording, say, I on fire for right. the first time, like, both of your guys' mental process. Well, I don't, I'm, I don't, we worked at them at slightly different eras. I think um, Matt Pike was slightly more consumed by alcoholism when I was working with him than... Uh, that's... Could, would be very difficult for some <laughs> um, um, But at any rate, I, I, this may be true, it may be your, maybe your perspective as well, but I think the idea that anybody could talk Matt Pike into doing anything other than what Matt Pike wanted to do at the moment <laughs> is kind of errant. Yeah, like I've definitely tried to produce Matt, and he, would, he does this like, I don't fucking know, dude, I just gotta like play it harder. Yeah. <laughs> um, we can just have Matt Pike story time yeah. if you want. <laughs> There, there are two people that I have met in music whose public image and actual persona, I'm gonna say three, there are three people that I've met in music whose public image and actual personality are precisely the same, welded together, not, there's not an ounce of show business to any of them. Matt Pike, nonstop drinking, shirtless, I don't fucking know, you know, yeah. nonstop. <laughs> Plus, the music pours out of him like water. That style of that style of music is what he breathes. There is no other thing to him. No other. It's not like he learned that. It's not like he's mimicking something. He has in him this very specific metal personality, and it just pours out of him well, like water. I asked him once what his like backup plan was in life, <laughs> which, is, which is something I enjoy asking all sorts of musicians, and I'd be curious to know what yours was. But, um, <laughs> but I asked Matt that, he's just like, like, what do you mean? And I was like, well, like, what if you didn't have a career? What if you had never picked up a guitar? He's like, well, like that would just never happen. Like, you know? <laughs> and he's like, no, just, you know, Suspension of disbelief, like, yeah. what would you be doing if you weren't playing guitar in High on Fire? Like, oh, race car driver. 
Yeah. Like, I mean, he could have told me president or like astronaut, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And for the record, the other two people that I've met who were exactly precisely what you would think they would be like were Fred Schneider and Iggy Pop. <laughs> and both of those people are singular people. All three of those people are singular, meaning they are exactly precisely what you think they're going to be, and there's only one of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kurt, your question is, Steve, uh, got me curious about what was your like, first album? Oh, the first time I heard like sound as yeah. a recording and yeah. not as just a song? Yeah, that's easy. Born in the USA. The snare drum sound. I was like, what is that? Because <laughs> I've heard a snare drum, and that's not what a snare drum sounds like. Um, yeah, well, I don't, I didn't even think about it in terms of good or bad. It was just like, this is, I mean, I don't know, it was like probably nine or something, eight or nine. And I used to just like listen to music on headphones at night um, when I was pretending to be asleep. And that, that, that song struck me. It struck me in a slightly different way. I'm sure it did. <laughs> I think uh, the snare drums as wishful thinking reminded me of that one, uh, the armed record you did where they wanted to re-trigger the snare with a gunshot. Was that, was that you who had to do that? I don't, doesn't sound familiar. Never mind then. I mean, I always, we, I mean, we always joke about like triggering like, you know, duck sounds or something. That, that band, yeah. they, they really like to fuck around in interviews, so it's entirely possible they made oh, that up. Oh, yeah, that's to, probably made up. That's, yeah, yeah, they yeah, probably yeah, made that up. That, but I was like, that, that band, sounds like something that would happen to Kurt. Like if you, if you ever see uh, like an interview with that band, it's, the person who's doing the interview is probably not in the band. If you see like a video of them, like the people probably are not in the band. And, like the people who play in the band live are not the same as the people who record and so forth and so it's on. Post post band band, it's it's a concept. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, I wanted to get both your feelings on the process of remastering because I'm a Steve Albini fan, thanks to that. And for me personally, that's the definitive version of that album. Um, and remastering, there's kind of the stigma attached to it because of the loudness wars. And in Europe in particular, it's like right on the cusp of when it really started to push up into like, the volume that the remastering process is. Well, obsolete. I should point out that my relationship with that record and my relationship with Nirvana were 100% defined by the band, meaning. Um, I worked with them be, and ex exclusively listened to them and their opinions. No, nothing that anybody else had to say about the record mattered to me. Um, the decisions that they made about that record, like the, they remixed a couple of songs, the, ultimately that record was, was released in the form that they wanted it to be, right? And I respect that totally and I respect them for sticking to their guns when everyone around them was just shitting their pants and wanted them to redo everything, right? Um, the, the one bit of credit that I will give the people in the business community around them, the music business scene around that band, was for the 2013 remaster of that album, they said, you can do it as, you can go to the wall for quality because we know we're going to charge a fucking fortune for this thing and people will pay it, right? So we were, we did... The, the remaster was an all analog cut at, at Abbey Road from the original half inch masters, in, cut directly into copper, full DMM processing, double 12 inch 45 LP. I mean, I literally don't know how to do it better. That's like every single thing that somebody would say, how would you go about manufacturing a vinyl record so it had the best fidelity? I would say, let's do all of these things, and we got to do every single one of them. So that was, that was great. I, they, you know, I got to go there and supervise the mastering. Uh, I was there for every minute of the production process up until the point where they started plating the metal on, uh, you know, to make the records. So uh, I have to give them credit for saying to the band, yes, you can indulge your every fantasy in making a, the super high fidelity version of the record. Now, if you contrast that with 1993, when the record was first released, it, it was a, a vinyl, the, the vinyl version of that record um, was perceived to be a loss leader for the CD. They were gonna lose money on the vinyl records because some fools, some schmucks still had LP players <laughs> at home, had record players at home, so they were gonna buy the vinyl record. They didn't really care about that. They wanted to shift people to CDs because the profit margin was so much higher. Um, in addition to it being, you know, one of 20 records that were in the queue to be released that month or whatever, uh, it was, it was, you know, a lot of things were done 
in a kind of a slipshod, not slipshod fashion, but they were done in a kind of a standard fashion. You know, um, it was a single, single 12 inch LP, 33 RPM. It was a relatively long record in terms of program time. I want to say it was almost 50 minutes. So the, the program time was kind of stretching what you could fit comfortably on a vinyl record. It was cut into lacquer, which was just the standard of the day, uh, at, which means that it had to be, there were several compromises that need to be ma needed to be made in the sound quality to fit it on. Uh, and then the pressings were just perfunctory, normal, you know, commodity item pressings that were done by the cheapest available bidder. Um, it was being pressed in all territories, so there were probably production masters made, meaning that instead of um, using this, the original cut of the record, there was a production master made that was then just cut flat at whatever chop shop record pressing record cutting plant there was in Sri Lanka at the time or whatever, you know. So every ter territory probably had its own slightly shoddier than normal mastering. So, um, so the, the comparison is pretty, pretty much the standard of LPs in the early 90s being pretty bad. It is crappy pressings of perfunctory mastering that, you know, of two long records that were being sold at a loss and so nobody really cared about them versus something that was sort of a presentation grade record where every, every step was taken with the utmost attention to detail and care. So I'm, I'm very proud of the, the end result of that remaster. The, there, were no, there was no aesthetic thrust to it, like we gotta make it ballsier or whatever, but the idea was to take the master tapes, which everyone liked, and make as accurate and as flattering a transfer of those to vinyl as possible. And I think they did it. I, like, I genuinely don't know how to do it better. Was it all your mixes on that one, or is it some main They did mixes? include the ones that they swapped out for the Scott Litt mixes, but oh, the, the, the proper LP, like if you buy the Super Deluxe version, you'll get a bunch of extra stuff, but if you just buy the remastered LP, it's the same, exact same material as on the 93 version, but with the new, new master. Okay. Oh, I, I don't think I have much to add to that, but um, I mean, I guess everyone's always um, concerned about revisionist history, right? Um, and, cha and changing things that people have come to love, but I've also been guilty of remixing old, old records that um, just for whatever constraints there, there were, um, didn't turn out the way that they were intended to turn out. Um, I'm actually in the middle of one right now, a thrash band that like recorded this record in 1987 and it's being remixed, you know? Um, well, it's interesting. I mean, there's, a, there's an interesting schism as well. Like, um, at, at the d beginning of the digital era and well into the, the 2000s, um, there were a lot of competing digital formats, all of which were temporarily fragile. That is, the, they t the masters are all now useless and unplayable. Um, and uh, there, but analog masters have all survived. Like they're, you know, analog masters are good for a hundred years or more. Uh, so there are scenarios where um, a record that was a, a, a popular, successful, and famous record was recorded on a digital system where the masters are now irretrievable. And I know one instance in particular of a of a top ten record that a friend of mine had and his label wanted to do a deluxe silver anniversary edition of it, and there was literally nothing that they could make the record from. They ended up using a commercial CD, uh, just an, a, an, a surviving CD copy of the record from, the, from its original release, and they just you know, repressed that. That was the deluxe silver anniversary edition because wow. all of the digital formats of the day are irretrievable now. You know, it, it, that's... I mean, this is a, an involved discussion that we probably don't want to get into now, but I persisted in making records in the analog domain principally because I regard my historical obligation as the most important one. And I have already been involved, like you, as you mentioned, I've been involved in significant anniversary editions of quite a few records that I worked on 20 plus years ago. And the reason that that's possible is because they have analog masters and the analog masters have survived. And it is now possible to do a better version, a, a better qualitatively, I'm not saying better aesthetically, I'm saying just a technically better 
reproduction of all of those original masters than would have been possible back in the day. Steve, I actually wanted to ask you a question about that because I've heard you um, give a similar answer in the past. Um, whose responsibility do you feel as though the archival of masters is? It's clearly the responsibility of the people whose music it is to make sure that their music survives, right? But we know that they often don't put any effort into that. Precisely why I, need, I record everything on analog tape because then they can just put the tape in the closet and it'll be there forever and they don't have to worry about it. My presumption is that the people who are like, especially the, you know, especially the budget sessions that I do where they're in and out quickly. Yeah. My presumption is that those people who can barely get around to tuning their guitars, that those people are not going to take pains to preserve their music in any active way. Right. And I also know that all of the very aggressive corporate uh, responsibility type archiving, digital archiving, backing up, re refreshing, re-refreshing archiving methods, those have all collapsed and failed as well. Like there is basically no way to preserve a digital recording beyond its immediate use. And because there isn't, I feel a heavy obligation to make the recordings that I make for my, the bands that have hired me to make them Bulletproof. I'm so, sure you were. So at the end of the day, the band gets the reel. It doesn't go to the label. You don't. Absolutely. You don't. You well, don't, you don't make a slave that you. That no, no, you no. Keep or uh, anything like that. There, there are a number of reasons why that's impractical. Yeah. One is that it's, uh, you know, there's a, a lot of stuff to store. Yeah, and yeah. also, well, I also, as much as I, as much as I, my my longstanding war with the concept of intellectual property survives, <laughs> um, it it would be in some cases illegal and in some cases a huge liability for me to store master tape, master quality versions of a client's material, mm -hmm. right? So we turn everything over to the client. Most cases now, the client is the band, is the artist. Right. There, in the historical period, the client was often a record label and the record label would, by default, because they paid for everything, they get to keep everything. Um, record labels have a notoriously terrible track record with maintaining masters and maintaining stability of their archives, right? Whereas musicians that I know, band members that I know, have a meticulous track record. Every, every musician that I know has a closet full of the tapes of their records, you know? Yeah. Uh, In so, varying condition. Yeah. But <laughs> the important thing is that it's there. Yeah. And I know that if I, if I give a band a master tape, they can put it on a closet, put it in a closet and do nothing else and take it off the shelf in 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 yeah. years, and the, then people will know what their music sounded like. Whereas that's not true of any of the digital formats that have prevailed up until the, now. Um, I don't know what it's called, but I know like Epitaph, the, the label that my band is on, um, they contract with a company that, that stores it on a digital tape format. That's like Iron the same Mountain. stuff. That's like, that the yeah, it's like that kind of, it's not yeah. Iron Mountain, but it's that sort of thing. Like, yeah. It's like bank records. Yeah, um, like that are stored on that type of digital tape. Do you should I give you the technical problems with that or the sure. practical ones? Okay, the technical sure. problems is um, I've never had to retrieve anything from it. Yeah, digital open reel tapes like nine track and things like that. Yeah. The the digital open reel tapes are uh, metal particle tapes rather than metal metal oxide tapes. Mm -hmm. Metal particles are chemically active, and so over time they oxidize and they physically delaminate and they change their uh, magnetic coercivity, and so you lose a lot of data on digital open digital. Uh, magnetic tapes, you over time you lose a lot of data. Um, in digital audio specifically, things like DAT and DA88 and ADAT and all those things, there's an extremely aggressive error concealment protocol that's built into the software that retranslates the, the digital data. Um, and that doesn't work with the massively larger digital files that are in high resolution audio now. Yeah. Um, so yeah, um, I'll see you in 20 years. <laughs> but I also know that like there, there was an automated system that Sony invested in where there was a, a robot that periodically was going to replace like cartridge, uh, hard, uh, yeah, solid state cartridges that were going to be holding their archive and all that. All that shit collapsed as well. Interesting. So. Oh, yeah. I believe you. I'll see you in 20 years. <laughs> they don't need to survive. You could build a tape machine in your garage. Analog technologies are all open source. There's a, there's a famous story. There's a studio in St. Petersburg, Russia, 
um, that during the Soviet era, they wanted to import an Ampex tape machine, and they weren't allowed to import an Ampex tape machine. So they got smuggled in, sort of Samizdat style, they got smuggled in a user's manual and a schematic for an Ampex tape machine. <laughs> and the chief engineer at the studio and his machinist friend, over the course of several weeks, they handmade a copy of an Ampex tape machine in, in his friend's machine shop. And that studio, that they, they did every, made every part. They made the head cores, they wound the transformers, they, made, they did every single part of that machine by hand. And that machine was the centerpiece of that studio that continued working into the 2000s. Um, it, I'm, I'm not saying that everyone will want to make a tape machine. I'm saying that it is possible. And because they are all open source and non-proprietary systems, they are mature technologies where almost everything about them is known. Uh, it is basically impossible to make a, an analog master unplayable. Now it is possible to physically destroy a tape. If you if you if you really want if you really try, you can burn, for example, an analog master tape. But uh, so and that's an, an argument that I've heard some people use. Like, what if my house burns down? Like, okay, uncle, not every house burns down, you know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm. This is an involved conversation that we probably shouldn't get into in the middle of this. But um, I remain convinced that it is impossible to make a future proof digital archive, if only because all of the recording sessions that we do are in, in, in the digital domain are beholden to proprietary software. And uh, the, the complexities of the interaction of commerce and intellectual property and artistic creativity mean that a lot of things are going to become unplayable or unusable in the future. And I, I, and I, I just keep getting proven right by, by, from the, this intuition that I had in the 1980s when people were telling me, yes, that was a problem, but it, we're going to figure it out soon, and it still hasn't been figured out. I mean, two weeks ago, MySpace lost everything. And that's bearing in mind that MySpace, as, as a, it's kind of a punchline now, but MySpace was the forum for an awful lot of musicians to, uh, that was the public face of an awful lot of musicians for a very specific era. And I personally know people who, for whose, their entire life's work was only ever represented on MySpace in terms of its public facing. They never had commercial releases or anything. And I think of the thousands of people who had put their life's work in that, in that format, and then some of them are dead now. And uh, their, their music, their ev the evidence of their creativity, their life on earth is now kind of gone. And I feel like that is the kind of tragedy that I, against all other trends, I need to defend against that as a tragedy. I need to defend against the music that I'm recording disappearing. I think vinyl is a very good playback medium. Uh, my, if you have an analog master, let's say I have a pristine analog master tape, I can make a high resolution digital transfer of that pristine analog master tape into any format that you, you would like. When, uh, to going back to the Nirvana remaster that I did in 2013, the first thing that we did when we started working on that remaster was the band assembled, the surviving band assembled at our studio in Chicago, and we just played the master tape for everybody to listen to. And it was shocking to everyone in the room because it, it reanimated the sense memory of hearing that music in the studio. They hadn't heard it in the studio since they'd done it. They'd only ever heard the commercially available version. And Chris Novoselic immediately asked for us to make him a high resolution copy of the master, a 24 bit copy of the master so that he could play it at home. And not, not the mastered EQ'd version or whatever, just he just wanted a flat transfer of the master so that he could have it at home. Um, in the dim distant future, let's say there's some super high resolution, one bit, you know, uh, delta mod version of digital that happens in the future where there's sort of essentially an infinite sampling rate or whatever. He could have a copy of that made in that format then as well. Yeah. As long, if the analog master survives, you can make a digital version of it in any format is my point. Yeah. Yes. This is sort of a two-part question, but speaking to not wanting to be a band psychologist, how do you engage the band about what they're looking to get out of the session, and 
what happens when they got nothing? Like when they're coming to you, <laughs> they're only there because of your name and reputation, and they're like, I want it to sound like you record, like they just, they're there. Well, I, I, for a start, nobody uh, admires my name and reputation so much that they will spend thousands of dollars with n no other purpose than acquiring it. Like, I wish that were the case. <laughs> I could do fucking supermarket openings and it would be awesome. Right? <laughs> um, so uh, everyone coming to me has some idea of what they want their music to sound like. And my job is, is to, to discern that and, and try to get them there. And if you're asking like what happens when a bad band wants to record a bad record, they get a bad record. They get to record, you know, a, I, I'm happy to let a bad band make a bad record in front of me if they want to, that's their, that's their business. And the other thing is that a lot of the music that my band and my peers bands made would have been laughed at by people who didn't get it, right? And I'm always open to the notion that I just don't get it. And that, you know, when you say, what, what, about, what happens if this band has nothing and they're just, you know, and they're, they're just flailing around? That could very easily be a problem of perception or what I would like to call listener error, you know? Um, well, the, if they have nothing, I don't necessarily mean, you know, song or talent or whatever. I mean, no concept of how they want things to sound recording wise. You know what I mean? I'm, that genuinely has never happened to me. Yeah, it's never been the case that someone has shown up at the studio and said, okay, make us a record. <laughs> yeah, I think that's, that's a sort of a bedside manner question, you know, like if somebody <laughs> is looking for validation about their guitar solo or whatever, you know, like I can play them take one and take two and see which one they prefer, but I, you know, I'm not gonna, I'm, I, I I've used this analogy before, uh, uh, so I'm going to use it again, but I feel like I should, I should really be like a gynecologist in that I shouldn't... Is that your backup plan? <laughs> in that I, I shouldn't be getting turned on by the vagina I'm working on at the moment. I shouldn't, have, I shouldn't be forming those kinds of opinions about it. I have a job to do. And so when a, a band comes in and they, they want me to be a fan or they want me to be a booster or they want me to be like a cheerleader in some fashion, well, I mean, I, I can try to keep the mood light and all that sort of stuff, but you never know what the internal politics of a band are. You never know what sociology has brought them to this moment. So I, I try very hard not to form opinions about the music that I'm, I'm working on. Occasionally you're overcome, um, you know, by something that is either awesome or awful and you you know you will form an opinion you know but i try very hard not to let that affect my demeanor or how i work on a record in the studio do you feel like you had the ability to separate yourself in that way early on because i imagine you were no. working with friends for a long time yeah when you're working with friends everything's jocular and informal and you're ball busting and then the first time you get yelled at by a friend is where you realize, oh, hey, yeah, actually, this is inappropriate for me in this role. And that's and I did have to sort of break myself of that. And I'm and I'm and, you know, I consider it a professional responsibility to when I'm working on a record, not to be an arbiter of taste or style or whatever. I feel like if I'm I, I don't want the band to be sitting there worried about whether or not I like them you know, whether or not I think they're cool enough to be here recording a record. You know, I want them to know that they're cool enough to be here recording a record and that they are responsible for how awesome it is and that, you know, that it's, it's their record and they get to have the experience that they want to have. Yeah, I think if you're talking band psychology, I think it's really important to lay that stuff out when the session is booked yeah. so that there's no surprises when you get there. It's really, it's true of, of really any contract, lay out what both parties are responsible for. Um, I fa actually found that, that taking deposits is not so much a financial move as it is a way to get the artists that I'm working with financially invested in the project early on, and that way uh, they're more likely to show up prepared. Yeah, I mean, we try to just talk about how, how prepared the songs are, like what sort of approach they want to take to tracking them. Are they going to be you know, live tracking or... Um, you know, doing one instrument at a time, just, you know, making sure that there's, there's sufficient time or that the, the amount of time that they've booked and what they're looking for from me is appropriate for what they're trying to accomplish. 
but their accomplishments are always um, are what I try to put put at the you know at the top of my list, and not what is my agenda for the record. As I I've noticed that um, the way that I've interacted with musicians has changed a lot, or the way, the way that musicians have viewed me has changed a lot over the years. As as my discography has grown, and as you know, I went from you know recording local. Well, it started with just recording friends, and that was easy. Then I started recording local people that I didn't know previously to recording. That got a little bit harder, and the process of of winning people's trust was a little bit more challenging. To now, where I have a discography where most of the people coming to record with me are familiar with my discography, and now I find a lot of those people are saying like, "Oh, we like what you did on this record. Just do that. Like, do do the Kurt Ballou thing or whatever." <laughs> and now I find myself trying to talk bands out of putting the decision making process on me and me trying to help empower them um, and to say that you know you're here because like I believe in what you're doing and I want to learn from you and I want to empower you to be what you are great at doing and I'm just here trying not to screw up your record. You know, like hopefully I can I can capture what you're doing and maybe enhance it a little bit, but um, my, my goal is to, you know, empower all the artists I work with. And it, it can be, it can be challenging sometimes to, um, to instill that confidence in the people that I'm working with, you know? Well, um, I feel like, I don't know if this is true with you, but I, I feel like even if a band seems like they don't know what to do, if you make it clear that they get to make these decisions and they start having conversations among the, amongst themselves and they, the, the first few decisions might come slowly, but once they get their sea legs and they realize that they actually are responsible for making a record and they, that they can trust that they're making decent decisions, like the first successful decision that they make makes the next one come faster and the one after that and the one after that. And before long, you have them, you know, shouting down the hallway what, what you should do on the mix, that sort of thing. Yeah, totally. Same, same thing here. Um, it's been interesting for me, and you've probably had this experience too, because I know you've worked with, with like the Stooges and with um, uh, Cheap Trick. Like I've worked with people that are, you know, whose music that I really revered as I was coming up. And I, you know, when like those people come into my studio, I'm like, I want to learn from you. I want to learn from you. And I'm expecting them to kind of like show me the ropes and show me how to do it and show me what's up. And then I realize like, oh, I haven't been doing anything wrong. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know, I just like, uh, yeah. these people make great records cause they made great records yeah. and, um, and I'm not doing anything wrong. I just have to, um, I just have to keep at it. And there know. is something kind of awesome about having your wildest dreams fulfilled. Yeah. You know, like the, the, one of the, one of the pinnacle and also most surreal moments of my life was answering the door intercom and hearing somebody say, Hey, it's Iggy at the front door yeah. to my building. Yeah. You know, that was incredibly gratifying to get to spend a month hanging out with the Stooges. And how you know? long does it take before you're just hanging out with Iggy or, or are you just sort of always in awe? Yeah. I mean, my, I was kind of slack jawed for a, a, a fair piece of that, you yeah. know, <laughs> uh, but it, you, you know, again, you have a job to do, so you have to like, yeah. you know, you have to button your britches and get to work. So, uh, but I, yeah, it was a great experience. Um, working with them, working with Cheap Trick, like Fred Schneider, like people that are that I've admired since I was a kid, yeah. like people who are responsible for me getting into music, you know, genuinely responsible for me getting into music. I mean, we've probably both recorded a ton of bands that think that they need to use a, spe a specific piece of gear to get a specific sound. And then you meet people like that who have been a part of such iconic records and you realize like, oh, they were doing exactly what we we're doing. They were just using whatever's around and yeah. it sounded like it sounded. Yeah. And then it's been... Um, you know, it's been romanticized over the years by listeners, but it, you know, they didn't know that it was going to be that when they were creating those records. Yeah. I, I'm, I, it is incredible how consistent the sort of fuck it, get on with it mentality <laughs> has been over the, with certain, certain bands that are, you know, especially bands that have had a heavy work schedule where the recording was not like a, a, a vacation or a, or a, um, like a, a big enterprise where the recording was just like, well, that's what we're doing that week. And then the next week we got to play, you know, this place and this place mm -hmm. and this place. And then, you know, we have the bingo halls and then we have the, you know, like um, the bands for whom recording was just another part of the job. Like uh, it is an impressive to see those people just chop wood. Like yeah. in, in particular, I worked with, when I worked with Cheap Trick, um, they had a, a collection of demos of songs that they'd written over the years. And they were sort of, 
reboiling the bones of those demos to see if there was any if there were any interesting nuggets there that they could could work on and they selected a couple of songs out of you know of you know of almost 30 years of stuff they found all these they found a couple of songs that they wanted to work on and they literally just wrote the chords out on uh on a yellow legal pad and then just went out there and banged the song out, like after having yeah. not played it in 25 years. You know, it's just, there's, there's something incredible about that That's level awesome. of comfort and confidence in your own ability that, that makes it so, working with people who are like that, they're, you know, they're legends for a reason. They're not just accidentally yeah. the legends. And probably did it on whatever amp or guitar was laying around. Yeah. Yeah. You know, or, or whatever didn't take too long. Right, yeah. 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 Well, I think uh, I, I got a warning that we've got like five minutes left. Um, okay. So I think I'm going to, I'd like to close it with sort of uh, one final question on a more optimistic note, which is uh, what is the record that you're waiting to make? Like what is, uh, you know, who, like, I guess, is there someone in particular who you, who you would like to work with? Or is there some uh, maybe abstract notion of a record that you're still trying to make, not just as, a, as an engineer, but as a musician? Um, like, just like where, like where, what's that one last thing you would, that you would love to do? I get asked stuff like this all the time and I always draw a blank. I think for me, it's just, it's the next one. Hmm. Like, cause then the next one leads to the next one and then leads to the next one. And, and the fact that I get to go on this journey with all these amazing people is just like the thing that I cherish more than anything and being able to constantly be part of um, creating stuff that has value to people is much more important to me than like a specific production idea that I haven't tried yet or a spe specific band that I haven't worked with. I have two answers. One of them is that I try, well, three. I, one of them is that I've, I've, my whole life I've tried not to have goals. Like I've tried not to have a, a specific goal that I was trying to achieve because up until you achieve that goal, you're frustrated. And then once you achieve that goal, you're aimless, right? So I, I, I've, never, I've never really had goals. I've al always sort of pursued a process. And for me, success is, you know, again and again, getting to execute that process. And that's sort of what you were saying. Like yeah. The fact that you're in it still is fantastic, right? Absolutely. So um, another response uh, would be that I've had the same list since about 1984, <laughs> and none of these people have called me. So what about, what about Iggy? Uh, well, that's true. So uh, <laughs> Neil Young, ACDC, Dolly Parton, Willie Nelson. That's about it. So any of those people, I've been saying, I've been, you know, it's like, is there anybody that you'd love to work with? I think I'd do a great job with all those, all any of those. I hope to hear that Neil Young record one of these days. That would be that'd that, the the that final the final answer is there's a thing I've been trying to talk bands into doing from the very beginning, and no one has ever let me do it on their record. This is the one thing that I've always wanted to try just to see if it would work. In a long instrumental fade out, during the fade out, as the fade out gets quiet, gradually replace each instrument with the band member, do, member doing a mouth mimic of his own instrument. Have you ever, have you ever heard of the band uh, Judd Judd? Oh, Judd Judd, fantastic. Okay. All right, great, okay, We cool. tried to get Judd Judd to play at a festival that we curated. We curated yeah. My band curated the All Tomorrow's Parties Festival. We tried to get them to come in, to England to play a, a, a show and they wouldn't do it. That would have been Converge something. actually did a song a cappella once when they cut the power to our amps but not the PA. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> a whole song? Oh yeah, well. Oh, wow. Uh, we got pretty far into it. Yeah. We got a we got a mosh pit. Now, right. challenge for you is uh, you have to make Judd dough now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, with that, I think that's pretty much all we have time for. So, thank you, Kurt. Thank you, Steve. This has been a really wonderful evening. Thanks, John. <laughs> of course, uh, thank you to Isotope and uh, Boston AES for putting this on. It's really been yes, a wonderful. Thank event. you very so, much. Have a good night, folks.